or later this year or soon, India is going to be the largest populated country, shifting according to this article, shifting the world's center of gravity. So turns out that between China and India, that accounts for about a third of the global population, which is quite incredible. The other thing that's happening in India right now is the almost the entire country is in a severe heat wave above 40 degrees Celsius because they use Celsius there. Yeah, how hot is that? I think 105 degrees. Almost throughout the whole country. So if you can picture. <laughs> Uh, uh, 104 degrees. Looking at the forecast for New Delhi, and it, it says in a week it's going to be 105 degrees in rain. Oh, God. Yeah, rain can even like touch the ground at that point. I mean, we're talking about over a billion people, 1.4 billion people, almost all of them at the same time living through over 100 degree heat. Which is pretty intense. I mean, it's not like it doesn't get hot there normally, but this is, seems to be the hottest it has been in a, a hundred years. So I don't know. It might just be worth <laughs> keeping your eyes on these kinds of things and thinking about them as as we're going along. Actually, I got that. I got that news from from Radiga Govindra John herself from Twitter which I can't recommend Twitter to anyone anymore. <laughs> it used to be, it used to be I would recommend Twitter, but I can't really anymore. I haven't gotten off of it, but I can't really tell you to get on it. That sounds terrible. But I know, I was kind of amazed by this. I don't know how that happened exactly. It must be some sort of anthropological circle that I, I must have be I don't know how. That was pretty good. Anyway, like I said, can't recommend it, but we're still on it, so it must be okay, right? <laughs> In the introduction, they bring up the idea of environmental justice which is something that we've, that's probably the last time we heard justice is the, I, I think, if I remember correctly in this class, we haven't really talked about justice too much yet. I think if Moran was talking about that, not that Moran was, not that Moran didn't know about justice, but that probably wasn't part of his textbook that much. Here and there, he would say it. But the word, the justice word, the word justice definitely came up in Hernandez. And if you remember, we were talking about, she was talking about the father of environmental justice, Dr. Robert Bullard, who actually also comes up in the in the footnotes to the, or the end notes to the introduction. So this idea of environmental justice, we kind of know a little bit about that, right? In the sense of understanding how things get differentially dumped or differentially um, put into communities that are unable to, uh, or the idea of ecological debt, oh, primary person for ecological debt couldn't be here. But, uh, you know, so this idea that people are owed things or that they are, un there, there is a need for justice among human beings is perhaps somewhat familiar to us. In this book, they go through what I thought was, uh, I think, useful. You can keep going back to it. I always get weirded out when there's a glossary, but there it is. Species of the glossary, species of justice, which you can go back and just get these little little sentences about justice and their ideas. And you have environmental justice there and all kinds of things. Um, this chapter, of course, is titled Spectral Justice, which we'll see in a second. Now, 
Well, let's see. Actually, let's pause there for a second. John, did you want to talk about these species of justice a little bit, or am I making that up? Uh, no, I was quite fascinated by how the term justice is not like a one-worded to one justice is not at all to what is equivalent. And there was so many different terms of justice that were in there while I was just skimming through it. I'm like, oh man, there's so many different. It, it's all it all depends on what the injustice is and then also the two terms of justice and injustice who are both different depending on what is either they have or what they they have lacked so it's mostly as well as, and then mostly injustice is mostly as well as what they have it just depends like it's not always about what they don't have sometimes it's the obligation of something to give or something to take and depending on what is yeah, I mean, I thought that was actually that was an interesting part from the the introduction. And again, I did not I did not make you read these because I just wanted to plunge into the story. But on page two of the introduction, it said injustice, the lack of something is often more tangible than justice, the supposed fullness or perfection of something. Right. Which I think is. I think we kind of can recognize that. Like we know when something is unjust, right? It feels like this, there's an injustice. But to make that into justice, like when we go out and try to demand justice for X, like can you ever get there, right? That's kind of a problem, but we can recognize injustice. So anyway, this was interesting. In this case, in the case we are reading, our main character, Chachi <laughs> demands this word, right, Tyler? Uh, yeah, yeah. What is that? It's like um, justice as substantive rather than procedural. Ooh, two big words here. Procedural justice and substantive justice. What's the difference? Substantive is like more, is more of a Rather than just going through the laws and whatever the laws say. I think that's, yeah. I mean, what it's really going to do. And you can look up both those terms in the glossary and read about them. But, I mean, I think if we had a, let's give ourselves a real life example. We have plenty of things that are happening all over this place. Let us say that someone has shot somebody through the door of a house and that person is taken through the law and we don't know what the law is going to say. Maybe the law is going to say, ah, I think they have some strange law in that place, which is like the the law of the castle or something, which is you can do whatever you want in your own house or something like that, you know. Now, hopefully this law will not apply, but you can imagine a situation in which a person goes to court and they say, well, you know, the law says this and the jury says that, and you've gone through the procedure and they're like, oh, well, okay, nothing happened, but that's the law. And that would be called procedural justice. Would anybody be happy? Well, some people would be happy, but would you really be happy if that happened? No, nobody's going to be happy. We want substantive justice. We want something to happen. We don't just want the law to be followed. The law sometimes is terrible. Anyway, procedural justice versus substantive justice. Uh, he says that this, uh, this draws on or or is related to something that the economist philosopher Amartya Sen talked about in his idea of justice, who he's sort of a very famous person uh, in the world of development and economics and also philosophy. Um, and he himself draws upon this, this concept of nayaya to indicate this, this need for substantive justice, which is, what, Anna? You were on the same page. What does she want to do here? Yeah. 
it needs she needs to make those connections. You used the word, or she did the word repair needs to repair relationships. So again, if you're just interested in somebody, I think somebody wanted her just to turn this over to the police, let the police handle it, right? And she doesn't want to because she thinks there's something larger going on here that even if the police did something, they can't really do what she wants to be done, the repair of relationships. By the way, why is Chachi always uncapitalized and Gatu the cow is capitalized? That seems mean. Yes. It's not their actual name. It's not their actual name. What does this mean? It means aunt or auntie in Hindu. So it's different people take it. Yeah, it's like affection, a term of affection, which I think is the relationship between the anthropologists yeah it's not it's not a real name i mean it's not a proper name it's, a, it's like i said it's auntie so we have this notion of repair and as she herself says sometimes you have to become a ghost to demand justice sometimes you have to become a ghost to demand justice liz this was actually your sentence. Why did you like it? <laughs> if like is the correct word. Oh, yes. Yeah, some people like this more than other people. The ghost. Sometimes you have to become a ghost to demand justice. Hmm. Do I like ghosts? I do not like ghosts. But... I can understand the idea that that in some ways justice is most demanded of us from people beyond. I mean, dying is sort of the old, you know, that's that's where justice comes to the fore. But yes, this is kind of there. You go becoming a ghost to demand justice. Yes, this chapter is called spectral justice. Cass, what is this spectral justice? Justice is spectral when it is haunted by the impossibility of its realization. Haunted by the impossibility of its realization. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a ghost per se, but that, you know, it can't be brought into light. And this bit, oh, by the way, one of the things I kind of like about this book is that everything happens in the notes. They don't have all these parentheses in there with the authors like, like Moran did and you're reading along and then you just run into 10 parentheses authors. And I mean, that's a nice system and we use it. I use it here and I make you guys do it. But in this book, they're using these end notes, which means then you have to look at a number and then you have to jump back, back to the back and see, not to the back, just to the end of the chapter and see what happens. But it makes the text flow nicely. In this case, in the idea of spectral justice, she's actually drawing on an interesting source or she cites in the end notes I hadn't heard about in a while. Jacques Derrida in a book called Specters of Marx. Jacques Derrida, boy, this name will ring a bell to anybody? Yeah, yeah you, you, have, you have to be pretty deep in your French philosophy deconstruction. He's kind of out of favor these days. When I was, when I went to college, Jacques Derrida came and it was a big deal. Somebody went and got their T-shirt signed by Jacques Derrida, but nobody could understand what he was saying, partly because he's French, partly because he's using these huge words and dealing, I mean, he's almost the inventor of something we call deconstruction. Although today the word deconstruction is thrown around, it just means 
Most people just mean you're taking something apart. He meant a very specific kind of literary philosophical thing. He was not associated with Marx at all. Marx is, you know, we know about Karl Marx. Marx is seen as that revolutionary, throw down the system, communism kind of guy, right? And so Jacques Derrida is up in his French world talking about all these funny things and this highfalutin language, deconstruction and literary this and philosophical that. And then later on in his life, he writes or comes to this, does this conference that he calls the Specters of Marx which was kind of confusing because you wouldn't think of Marx was definitely not one of those afterlife spooky guys. He was more in one of those let's overthrow the system, historical materialism, religion is the opiate of the people guys, right? You all know that from Marx. Anyway, I dug out my copy of Specters of Marx for this one because Derrida makes the amazing observation. Well, first he said, I reread the manifesto of the Communist Party. I confess it to my shame I had not done so for decades. So he first says that he, you know, he's organizing this conference and he wants to reread the Communist Manifesto and he hadn't seen it for decades, which is more than you all have been alive. But I might be able to say this. I hadn't reread it for decades. And he says, he looks at the first line of the Communist Manifesto and he wasn't even expecting it. A specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. There it is, the specter of communism. And, you know, how can communism be haunting Europe? How can something dead be haunting Europe when it isn't even alive yet? As in Hamlet. Y'all remember Hamlet? <laughs> Another good one. Haven't seen it in decades. The prince of a rotten state, everything begins by the apparition of a specter, more precisely by the waiting for this apparition. You may remember Hamlet from me assigning you Hamlet, no, Shakespeare in the bush, where it starts out with a ghost. And that's how we know it all starts out with a ghost. Anyway, the point of the matter is that this sort of afterlife is often what haunts us both in terms of social justice for people and for things. But in this case, animals, animals, animals demand justice too. Right, Autumn? <laughs> Do you believe this? Yeah, you said it was going to be controversial. So, you're a believer. Yes, that's the central question, right? Is justice only for humans? Because, as we typically put it, justice is only something that humans can think of. Why would something outside of humans, they're just, they're just there. It's only in the human sphere that we imagine that things can be just and unjust. When a cat catches a mouse and does whatever it does, we don't demand justice for the mouse. We don't think that the mouse thinks of justice, right? I mean, well, some people in this class don't buy it like Liam. He doesn't buy it at all. He went on a whole rant about it, right, Liam? <laughs> I just, I think it's, I think justice is the wrong word. That's my, that's my real argument. I think justice is just the wrong word. The wrong word. Anthropomorphizing. All right. So here's my argument about this. I can understand what you'd say, I think. So first point on this, 
Who kills Gatu the cow? Who did it? Pass. Leopards. The leopards did it. And in fact, as she says in the end notes, these leopards killing cows videos have become very popular. In fact, this one went viral. You can even go see it for yourself. I'm not going to show it to you because it's yuck. <laughs> but if you want to see leopards killing cows, you can see them. They're being passed around in India itself. This is not just a thing that we do. This is a thing that other people do, too. They pass around videos on WhatsApp and those kinds of things. Because everybody else in the world uses WhatsApp. You know that, right? Okay. <laughs> so... The leopard is the one that kills the cow. Now, the reason I think this is important is that we have to remember the cow, when, the, when, when Chachi says that the cow is demanding justice, she's not saying that the cow is trying to get its killers. She's not out there hunting down leopards. Nobody says anything about the leopards, right? I mean, usually when one human hurts another, we go try to get justice on the human. We're not talking about getting the leopards here, okay? Leopards can be leopards. Nobody's worried about the leopards. We're worried about justice among the humans. By the way, what what kind of, why is she upset by this? The leopards are just being leopards. What was supposed to happen? Yeah, Tori. Yeah, the, they were supposed to take care of the bull. In fact, she had even paid these people to come take the bull away, which seems kind of mean that you have to pay somebody to take something off your hands. That's kind of harsh, right? And she'd done that, and yet here was it, getting killed by a leopard instead of getting taken care of. So the justice she's demanding is about this whole situation. It's not with the leopards, right? So if it were just from the animal's perspective, like, no, this is not about that. This is about something going on. The other thing I'm going to say is these are not... I mean, the leopards obviously are not under human control, but in terms of what kind of cows we're dealing with, we're dealing with very domesticated animals. Why are there so many cows in this place? What are all the cows doing? There's another book that you might be interested in. She cites in the footnotes by Catherine Gillespie, The Cow with Ear Tag Number 1389, which is sort of about the journey of cows from, from uh, farm to plate, you might say. <laughs> yeah. It's say in India, the cows are like deifying. So it's like, I don't want to say so long, but it's like a, they're like sigils. Yeah, I mean, we'll talk about the, the the relationship of cows and deification in a bit, but I'm just kind of thinking about why are, I mean, it's one thing to have cows be deities, but there's a there's more cows here than there were before. There's a lot more cows. Yeah, cows. They not only had a dairy-based economy, there was a whole huge government program of artificial insemination, and they were trying to promote these cows. And so all of a sudden, these women have to take care of more and more cows than before, and this huge amount of work, and now they've got to take care of this bull, which is a problem. So there's a whole, I mean, when we talk about justice here, we're not just talking about animal justice in the terms of like animals out in the forest. We're talking about things that have been done on, on a government level so that some people have to take care of a bunch of cows or it's supposed to be helping people, but it's not. And it's also a political issue because with the rise of, uh, of Hindu, what's called Hindu nationalism or what she calls uh, Hindu supremacism. So India is approximately 80% Hindu but the constitution allows for freedom of religion and and you know, you're supposed to treat people, people equally. Um, probably the main minority religion in Hindu is, 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 are the Muslims. And um, the thing is, is that because of the deity status, there's been these basically vigilante Hindu groups who are lynching primarily Muslims for eating, killing cows. And so, as she says, not only are there more cows up here, actually, this is page 
36 and 37. So not only are there more cows, in the old days, they probably would have been able to, you know, let them be or sell them or, you know, kind of pass them along to other groups who would do something with them. However, by the time we found Gatu in summer 2019, the ever-present threat of being lynched by Hindu supremacists meant that few people, especially Muslims and Dalits, the untouchable caste, caste, who were targets of vigilante violence were willing to risk transporting cattle from the hills to the plains. So in the old days, they would have just kind of negotiated this and somebody would have probably taken it from the hills to the plains and everything would have been okay. But now we have problems like this emerging. So again, the issue of justice is not about necessarily about the cow. I mean, it is about the cow, that's true, but it has to do with this larger social framework. The other thing I will say here is animals demand justice too. Who says that? Whose phrasing is that? is on page 43. The person who says this, they're actually in line to talk to a guru. And this, they're in line behind this elderly grandmother and elderly grandfather. When Chachi tells them this story, they're like, yeah, I know that. That happened to me. And so the actual person who tells this, who says this, is this elderly grandfather. Not the grandfather in charge, it's just our author describes him as a grandfather because he probably, oh yeah, because he's there for his grandson who's getting in trouble with like gangs and alcohol and stuff. So he's there to try and figure this out. Now, if you are an anthropologist and an elderly grandfather tells you that animals demand justice too, <laughs> what do you say back? <laughs> if you were in her shoes, you would agree. Yeah, I mean, you can think to yourself, oh, I don't know if I agree with that. But if you're an anthropologist trying to listen to people, <laughs> you just, you don't want to say, nah, I don't believe it, man. <laughs> you, that's wrong. <laughs> That's wrong, grandfather dude, and I'm here to tell you why. So, on the one hand, you know, it's, you might, you know, you don't have to believe everybody, but you probably don't want to tell him he's wrong. Now, you also want to, I'm glad you're leading us in here, you also want to document, of course, the range of, the range of opinions in any society, because... What does her son think about this? So again, this is not her real grandfather. This is just some grandfather there who's an old guy. But her son, what's her son say, Jacob? <laughs> he is not on board. No, he's like, no. <laughs> uh -uh. She cares about cows too much. So, you know, within any society, there's going to be a range of variation between the people who are into it and the people who are not. And so, you know, as an anthropologist, you don't believe everybody, but you do try to record the opinions of everybody. Actually, I looked up Pushkar, her son, here on page 42, he says, meh. You may remember at the beginning, he says, when she finds that animal, we're dead. Yeah, I think he's thinking already that this is going to mess up his life and this his mom is going to be taking him around on all these things. And sure enough, she does. And then he has to drive her all the way to this guru and she comes out and he's asleep in the car, pops up the car. She slams the door and he, she's really mad and she says something like, oh yeah, that guru told me to donate to a cow shelter. And he's like, hey, let's go do that. Should I stop and donate to a cow shelter? <laughs> and by the way, I'm saying this because if any of you have a parental relationship with your parents, this is not a good way to behave because she's like, ah, da, da. he's not taking this seriously, that stupid son of mine. Anyway, <laughs> there's some internal disagreement here. One of the areas of internal disagreement has to do with something 
big words here that Govindrajan talks about as ontological categories. Ontological categories. Ontological. Liz, what are ontological categories? Ontological categories. We're almost in Derrida, French philosophy land here. These are some big, big, big words. It's be funny that this becomes about because the question on our minds here is, can cows become ghosts? This is a huge ontological category question. Okay, so when, when the philosopher types use the word ontology or ontological, it basically refers to a category of being. Can some, how, how, what is the status of being in the world? What is the, what is our relationship? What do we become after we die? What is our relationship with animals? These are all sort of ontological questions, questions of being. And here the question for Chachi is, can a cow, after it is no longer a cow, become a ghost? What does the guru tell her about that? By the way, there's a guru in India, and so she's gone to consult. And she goes in and says, I saw the cow come back as a ghost. Guru says, yeah. Yeah, the guru says, didn't happen, can't happen. It must be an unhappy woman coming to you. Different ontological status, right? Can't happen. Because, yes, the guru is concerned with preserving the deity status of the cow. As we've learned, cows are sacred in Hindu ideology, right? And so... The guru says it can't be. The cow cannot turn into a ghost. And what you should do is go donate to a cow shelter instead and everything will be fine. Now, as one of the things that's kind of funky about this is that cows are sacred as female cows. But they're not quite sure what to do with the bulls. And this was a bull. So Chachi's already a little bit suspicious about this guru because the cow is sacred. What about this bull? Is that really a sacred thing? Hard to say. Now, Chachi comes to the conclusion that if cows are deities, then they must be able to become goats, obviously. Ah, uh, yes. What, this is on page 46. What disturbed Chachi about the guru's denial of these entanglements, specifically Gatu's ontological transformation. There you go. An ontological transformation from cow to ghost, from bull to ghost, was that it foreclosed the very possibility that Gatu was seeking spectral justice. So she's mad because if cows can't become ghost, if you can't go from bull to ghost, then you can't have justice. You can't have what she wants. Blah, 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 blah. Now, you have to remember that spectral justice is very central to this thing, and so the guru's disbelief is makes her mad. And then she says this, perhaps this didn't happen as much earlier, she mused. Um, perhaps that's why the guru didn't believe me. But then again, nobody abandoned their cows earlier. As the times keep changing, the ghosts keep changing. So, you know, Chachi's trying to navigate this landscape in which they have all these cows around. She says, in the old days, people didn't have to abandon their cows. Now they are. Times are changing. The ghosts are changing. And so she suspects that this is a true issue. Ontological categories. As long as we're talking philosophy, 
we might as go well go with the other word that is often used around ontological, which is epistemological. So if you have an ontological issue, you have an issue of being, a category of being, transforming from one thing into another, or how we relate to each other, how the world, what the world is made of. An epistemological issue is an issue of knowledge, how we know what the world is like, what we, how we know, how we can connect our observations to reality and make statements about reality is an issue that the philosophers call epistemological. Now, the best example of an epistemological issue here is actually on page 46 still. So if he goes to the guru and is not satisfied with the guru's ontological dismissal of this idea that she has, but when she goes to her buddies, they are kind of, they're mediums and they're kind of suspicious too. Well, I don't know if they're suspicious. They don't want to say that she's lying, but they do think that she might not be interpreting the world correctly. What do they think happened to her? You came to me and say that a red-eyed bull hit you in the middle of the night with its hot breath and tail. Oh, crazy. Well, they they don't want to say that. That would be too much. Now you remember, they know that the people, you know, but if my kid told me this, no, no, no. What do they think? Yes. <laughs> Having a nightmare, right? Are you sure it's not a nightmare, they say? And they want to be nice to her because, you know, <laughs> these are friends. They're not like the guru. They're not being paid to do this. The guru was was just being dismissive because he, these and they're, they're, they deal with these things. And they say, hey, maybe you had a nightmare. It's definitely what I'd say if somebody told me about this, right? But, you know, what she says here, or she draws upon her embodied experience. The fact that she actually had been, had been, in fact, no, you're right, Mickey. She had been in some ways possessed or visited by a ghost before. And so she drew upon that experience in order to say, hey, I know what a nightmare is. This was not a nightmare. This is my embodied experience. I'm citing my lived experience with these things. And that's what makes this real. So this is how... This is both on page 40 at the beginning of the eth ethnographic story and on page 48 as the, the, the account ends. He still comes at night, Chachi told me during a phone conversation in early 2020, probably around the time that COVID hit and they had to talk on the phone instead. When I asked if she found it hard to sleep, she said, I do feel scared, but what to do? He won't go until he receives justice. So there it is. The last.